It is a long time since a few persons met in 1848 in a little Methodist church in Seneca Falls to discuss the status of women under the laws of New York. That was the first woman's rights convention ever held in the world. A declaration was read and signed by many of those present and a series of radical resolutions adopted. But the majority of women ridiculed the idea of political rights for themselves. The press caricatured the convention, the pulpit denounced it, and some who took part withdrew their names and appeared no more on our platform. But above this wave of petty clamor that rolled from Maine to Louisiana arose the clarion voice of Wendell Phillips. This is the inauguration of the most momentous reform yet launched upon the world, the first organized protest against the injustice that has brooded for ages over the character and destiny of one half the human race. My own rebellion began many years earlier, when I was a child. The daughter of Daniel Cady, one of the great jurists of New York State's history, I had an early education in the law's unequal applications. The women who sought my father's counsel were answered with the cruel statutes that robbed them of the property, their wages, and sometimes most horribly, the custody of their children. In my childish way, I thought that if I could apply scissors to such odious laws, I could be a savior. To save his books, my father told me that if all his books should be destroyed, it would not make a bit of difference to the law. When I was a grown woman, he said, I must go to Albany and tell the legislators of the injustice I witnessed in his law office. I must demand that they change the laws. You might be interested to know that I grew up and did precisely that. Had I been my father's son, he would have nothing but pride for me. But his daughter's public defiance of injustice brought him nothing but shame. My parents loved me, but my childhood, though one of privilege and wealth, was also marked by the rigidity of social regulation, much worse because I was a girl. If my sisters and I had followed all the rules, we might as well have been embalmed as mummies for all the pleasure and freedom we should have had in our childhood. To my nurse, I vehemently exclaimed that I did not relish the promise of heaven, as I could only assume that we would be denied liberty there as we had been denied liberty on earth. I am so tired of the everlasting no. At the very heart of my rebellion was a dawning realization that while my own thoughts, feelings, and ambitions were principal to me, they were of no consequence to my father. He raised me with all the warmth his Calvinist background permitted. But when he looked at me, he did not see a soul standing equal to him before the great creator of life and destiny. I would make a fine wife and mother of the Republic one day, but a citizen in my own right? No. When I was 11, Eliezer, my parents' last surviving son, and the apple of their eye, completed his education at Union College. My parents rejoiced that such a fine son had survived all the travails of childhood to become a young man certain to secure our family's legacy. Then suddenly, cruelly, Eliezer died. And with him, all my father's hopes for the future. I will always recall tiptoeing into the darkened parlor to find casket, mirrors, and pictures all draped in white. And my father, broken and mourning, sitting alone. Knowing not what else to do, I climbed up on his lap and laid my head against his chest and listened to his heart. He drew his arms around me and whispered in his grief, Oh, my daughter, if only you were a boy, 
I will try to be everything to you my brother would have been, I told him. And in the days that followed, as I visited the cemetery with father and watched him stretch himself across my brother's grave, I carefully planned how I would heal my father's heart. I thought the chief thing to do to replace my brother in father's affection was to become learned, brave, and wise. In the years that followed, I did everything in my power to win his approval. But each time I laid an offering of personal accomplishments upon that filial altar, Father would merely smile sadly, as if with a secret I could not bear. Ah, my child, you should have been a boy. In time, I would marry and have my own sons and daughters. And I would raise those children not in the door shadows of religious superstition, not in the shadows of social conformity, but in the wholesome sunlight of liberty. Rather too much liberty, thought their Aunt Susan. Even as my house filled up with babies, a veritable bevy of, in my husband's words, miserable little underdeveloped vandals, I craved more liberty, pursued equality. The first Women's Rights Convention of 1848 fired off with Lucretia Mott, Martha Wright, Jane Hunt, Mary Ann McClintock, and her brave daughters, was my opening salvo as a public intellectual. Frederick Douglass and other good men were also willing recruits to our cause. With the advent of Susan B. Anthony's partnership, and often with her cautious reproach, I launched myself into one radical battle after another. When household duties curtailed my public life, I wrote speeches for Susan to carry to the world. I forged the thunderbolts, and she fired them. A woman's first duty is to herself, Subservience in a free nation is beneath the dignity of citizenship. I demanded our right to vote, to work, and to keep our wages. I defended our right to custody of our children and agency over our bodies, our property, and our future. I demanded that women have entry into colleges and universities, businesses and professions. I agitated for the right to wear what we wanted, to travel as we wished, and to live as we saw fit. I declared that women must have the right to self-sovereignty, the right to divorce, and the right to choose when and if we become mothers. As I aged and saw the passing of the beloved companions of my youth, Questions of eternity inevitably passed through my mind. However, I was never content with the old answers. I would not accept the old lie that women are by their very nature the sinful daughters of Eve. No more did I accept that women are angels. The talk about women being so much above men, celestial, ethereal, and all that, is sentimental nonsense. She is on the same material plane with men, striving and working to support herself. With Matilda Jocelyn Gage, I demanded an end to the interference of the church in secular affairs. I was a free thinker and follow Lucretia Mott's advice to settle for nothing less than truth for authority and never to accept authority for truth. My grandchildren called me Queen Mother. The press began to praise my white curls and jolly good humor, but I was not done. I published the woman's Bible and welcomed the storms of outrage that followed. In all things, I followed my own conscience. I knew my own mind and did not seek the counsel of a world I took to be irrational and unjust. My own settled maxim was that the existing public sentiment on any subject 
is wrong. At the inauguration of our movement, we numbered in our Declaration of Sentiments 18 grievances covering the whole range of human experience. On none of these did we talk with bated breath. Note the radical claims we made and think how the world responded. Colleges were built for women and many of the older male colleges opened their doors to our sex. Laws were modified in our favor. The professions were thrown open to us. In short, in response to our radicalism, the bulwark of the enemy fell as never since. On my own generation, I could say, we are citizens, property holders, taxpayers. We have guided great movements of charity, established missions, edited journals, published works on history, economy, and statistics. We have governed nations, led armies, filled the professor's chair, taught philosophy and mathematics to the savants of our age, discovered planets, piloted ships, crossed the sea. And yet, we were denied the most sacred rights of citizenship. There were too many in my generation, as there are in your own, who preferred the men to speak for us, and who would, even as their lives and livelihoods were trivialized and dismissed, insist that they had all the rights they needed. Family turned from us, friends abandoned us, doors were locked to us, an army marches on its stomach, and we never seem to have the funding necessary to complete our campaigns. When we could not see our way forward in the clear light of day, we stumbled forward in the dark. I traversed this nation proclaiming the right of equality and the duties of citizenship for American women. From crowded city lecture halls to tiny country churches, I spoke the truth as I understood it. In my speech entitled, Our Girls, I demanded to know why, when girls may grow into the fullness of their womanhood, we have instead stunted their development. They have awakened to the fact that they belong to a subject, degraded, ostracized class, that to fill their man-appointed sphere, they can have no individual character, no life purpose, no personal freedom, aim or ambition. They are simply to revolve around some man, to live only for him, to be fed, clothed, housed, guarded and controlled by him. Never to know the freedom and dignity that are secured in self-dependence and self-support. As important as we understood the right to vote to be, we could not forget that it was merely a tool to secure our most basic human right, still denied to us, the right to stand on our own two feet as sovereigns of our own destinies. Many in my own generation did not want to hear this message. They preferred to lean rather than to stand. These precious few women, enjoying for a time, a time anyway, the wealth and attention of their husbands and fathers, denied the rights of the many to protect the privileges of the few. They demanded, but did not get my silence. When they could not silence me with ridicule, they tried flattery. Calling women angels, they begged us not to sully the purity that was ours alone. To those who tried this tactic, I said, I challenge your admiration, and moreover, claiming as I do a share in all her outrages and sufferings, in the cruel injustice, contempt, and ridicule now heaped upon her, in her deep degradation, hopelessness, wretchedness, by all that is helpless in her present condition, that is false in law and public sentiment, I urge your generous consideration. For as my heart swells with pride to behold woman in the highest walks of literature and art, 
it grows big enough to take in those who are bleeding in the dust. Mine was not an easy message, especially to those who preferred to accept the privileges of so-called angels rather than the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. And I would not reach across time to speak to you if I did not feel the time had fully come for the question of woman's wrongs to be laid before the public. Did I not believe that woman herself must do this work? For woman alone can understand the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of her own degradation. Men cannot speak for her. Every rational being, every citizen, must find a way to set fear aside to speak the truth. And I swear to you, my dear daughters, this is the truth. Whether or not the powers of the world acknowledge it, you are your brother's equals. Your joys and sorrows, duties and dreams are as great, and your obligation to answer to whatever power calls to you is as urgent. It is the deepest outrage, the most loathsome injustice to stand in the way of another soul's right to self-sovereignty. Do not accept it. In 1776, Abigail Adams told her husband to remember the ladies. He thought it a joke, and we waited 72 long years before we found the opportunity and the courage to stand together in Seneca Falls. It was another 72 years before my granddaughter's generation secured the right to vote. And since then, a century has unfolded, a century of working and fighting and daring for equal representation, for equal education, for equal opportunity, for equal pay. A century, a century demanding the dignity of constitutionally protected citizenship that is our birthright. From the other side of history, I lay claim to a life lived in defiance of the everlasting no, though I cannot claim that I never outran my guide or surrendered to the baser lure of expediency at my friend's expense. Frederick Douglass can tell you about that. But he can also tell you that though it is harder to forgive our friends than our enemies, we stood together at the end just as we had at the beginning. In 1897, when I learned that the city of Rochester was erecting a statue to my dear friend's memory, I recalled some of the last words that passed between us. He remarked that though I had been denied the rights of citizenship on account of my sex and he on account of his color, he felt sure that we would stand on equal ground with the angels in heaven. Alas, I answered, we had better not be too sure of that, for earthly prejudices die hard, and even St. Peter might be influenced by some of the antis of color or sex. Then, he replied, hand in hand, we will go below. Now, as you celebrate this anniversary of the first Women's Rights Convention, and the generation of suffragists, reformers, and radicals I represent. Remember that those of us who spent our lifetimes questioning all the powers of heaven and hell would not have future generations make icons of us. As much as we relied on each other, I can tell you that we never mistook each other for angels. Remember our work and how much it cost us. We tried, dear hearts, we tried. But I never believed in the notion that children are indebted to their ancestors. Instead, I believe parents can never pay the debt they owe their children for bringing them into this world of suffering. Forgive us if you can. Whatever our accomplishments, whatever our failures, history has now closed upon us. It was for you that we did this work, and it is upon your shoulders that we must now lay the yoke. Wendell Phillips once said that to be as good as our fathers, we must be better. 
this is true of our mothers as well. It is not enough to celebrate what we accomplished in 1848. To be as good as us, you must be better. To honor our path, you must move forward. Be courageous. You do not need monuments to remember us. Whatever our mistakes, you are strong enough to write them. Whatever was good in us is already written in your hearts.